So I've been teaching and studying history and philosophy for about 35 years now. Well, that's a long time. And lately I've been having these very weird dreams, and I'll share one of them with you. I dream that I'm on this highway, and it's called the History Highway. It's sort of like an interstate, and my wife is doing the driving. And I'm looking out the window, and I'm seeing things go by on the side of the road. And I see people and places and events, and I'm thinking, this must be the things that I've been studying and teaching about all this time. So we just keep going down the road, and it seems like we're getting closer to the present. So then we go a couple of miles, and there's a sign on the side of the road, and it says, exit to the bridge where they know what really happened. And I said to my wife, turn here, turn here. So we get off the exit, we go down the ramp, and there's no bridge. There's a little sign, and there's a river, and it says, the little sign says, this is the river of time. And the river is flowing in the same direction that the highway was. And I look out the window, and there's an old man standing at the bank of the river. He's got a long gray beard, he's got a toga. And I said, my wife said, who in the world is that? And I looked at him and I said, my God, I think that's Aristotle. She said, Aristotle? What the heck is he doing here? I said, well, I guess I'll find out. So I get out of the car and I go over and I walk up to him and I said, excuse me, are you Aristotle? And he said, well, yes, you must be Raymond. I said, how do you know that? He said, oh, I've been expecting you. I said, you've been expecting me? I said, how do you know about me? He said, I heard that you took a class in graduate school on me and I heard you did very well. I said, well, I got a B. But, you know, Father Dolan, we called him C.D. Dolan because usually he gave out mostly C's and D's. So a B was pretty good. He said, no, no, that's fine. That's really good. And I said, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I came to tell you about the bridge or lack thereof because there is no bridge here and there never was a bridge here. And I really didn't understand. And then I thought, maybe I'll put a little levity in there. Hey, it's my dream. And I said, um, well, you know, I was watching a movie on Netflix a couple of days ago, and it was a history movie, and it said at the bottom of the screen when it started, uh, based on a true story, so maybe there's some movie producers over on the other side of the river. And he said, oh, no, no, not over there. That is the land where they know what really happened. Only the gods live there. And I said, okay, so no human beings can go there. He said, no, that's reserved for the gods. So I wasn't quite sure. And then he said, look, do you remember in the class, you read my book, Aristotle's Ethics, didn't you? I said, yes. He said, that was one of my favorites. I said, I liked it too. He said, do you remember the part where I talked about you can only allow a subject to have as much accuracy as the subject admits? And I said, oh yeah, I remember that line very well. It was very profound. He said, well, be student, maybe you can tell me what it means. And I said, well, I took it as that every field of knowledge has a degree of uncertainty. There is no certainty, and some have more certainty than others. And he said, that's quite good. That's really very good. You did very well. So I started back to the car to tell my wife, and I turned around, he's gone, just like that. So I was trying to figure out what this dream was trying to tell me. And I'm sort of a weather junkie, too. And whenever there's a hurricane, if you watch the Weather Channel, they have all these meteorologists huddled around the desk, and they have the computer models going in every which way. And then they have this big map, and there's this big cone. And there's the hurricane over here, and they're trying to tell you where the hurricane is going to hit. And I call this the cone of uncertainty. So the hurricane's way out here. Here's Georgia over here, those poor people. And they're not quite sure where it's going to go. And as it gets a little closer, the cone goes a little less, and a little less, but it never really goes away. You really can't factor it out. And I was thinking, in most fields of knowledge, you have this cone of uncertainty. Some have more than others. For example, mathematics. Mathematics is very precise. So when I go and get my taxes done, if the accountant says to me, I ask him, how much money do I owe this year to the IRS? And he says, well, $1,000, give or take 100 bucks. Of course, I'd fire him immediately because mathematics gives us certainty. That's the nature of mathematics. Then when you get to the physical sciences, physics, chemistry, 
you have a great deal of precision, a very small cone of uncertainty. They can do experiments in labs, and they have all sorts of procedures, and they can really come up with very precise results, but never perfect results. There's always that factor there. And then you get into the social sciences, psychology, sociology, anthropology, and there you have a much wider cone because now you're dealing with human beings. And most of the time they're not in the laboratory. And human beings are very unpredictable. So the cone becomes very wide. So you're wondering, what happens when you get to history? Well, it's just conversation. That's all there is. And, you know, it's like being a detective to being a historian. You're trying to figure out what happened. So you interview people, you look for sources, eyewitness testimony, which is notoriously unreliable. You try to talk to people who were there. You try to look for documents. You'll visit the place yourself. And then you'll go, go back and you'll write this narrative. And you'll try to tell the story about what really happened. And you know, if you look at any of these narratives, every historian has a different narrative of what went on at a particular time and in a particular place. And I'll give you a very good example of this. Four score and 16,000 books ago, Abraham Lincoln, that's how many books were written about him, we're still getting books about Abraham Lincoln. More books have been written about Lincoln than any other historical figure. And by the way, there are 20 new books a year written about Lincoln. So where does it end? The narrative keeps going. How can they keep finding stuff out about him? But this is the nature of it, the uncertainty of it, and people continue to find uh, new things. And many, many years ago when I was a graduate student, I was down in Washington, D.C., and I kind of snuck into a luncheon, and Ken Burns was the guest speaker. And the Civil War series, which some of you may have seen on PBS, had just come out. So he's talking about it, and he's telling us how it was produced, and the characters, and what he was uh, trying to do. And then at the end, there was some time for questions and answers. So these historians get up, and they start. Well, I don't really like your critique of Antietam. I wouldn't have done it that way. He sits down. Another historian gets up. He says, you know, your attitude about slavery and the relationship with Lincoln, and this goes on and on. Another guy gets up and says, well, you know, um, the end of the war and the surrender, I don't think you got that right. And I can see that Burns is getting increasingly irritated. So finally he said, I think in total exasperation, look, if you can get a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities and a film crew, make your own documentary. And he sat down. And I never forgot that. So this is kind of where we are. We're left with narratives. We're left with incomplete narratives, incomplete evidence, facts that are missing. And I often wondered what would happen if somebody made a claim to have absolute knowledge and absolute certainty. And that, of course, has been done. History has shown that. And I'll give you one example. The example I'll give you is Nazi Germany. This man, Hitler, comes to power, and he comes up with this ridiculous, totally unfactual narrative. He blames the entire ills of Western civilization on one group of people. And you know what happened. This narrative begins to grow. He begins to get very popular. People begin to follow him. And then anyone who opposes him, anyone who strays off the narrative, disappears. And then after that, he decides that since these people have caused all these problems, they need to be exterminated. And this is what people do when they say they possess absolute knowledge with no tests in reality. This is what happens when people claim to have the knowledge of the gods. And so what is, what's the answer to all of this? The answer is that the narrative can't stop. It can never stop. We need to continue to talk about history and write about history and debate about history, even though it's imperfect. It's imperfect because we're imperfect, because we are human beings. So the story must always continue. And history defines us as individuals. I think history also defines us as a people. So we have an obligation to pass this on to the next generation so they don't forget either. So I'll leave you with one word of warning. And this is from the historian and philosopher Will Durant. And I spent a great deal of time studying him. He spent a lifetime 
studying Western civilization. And Durant said, and I want you to remember this, whenever you read a work of history, always, always keep one eye on the historian. Thank you.